This is Corolla Digital. Socrates, Buddha, Lombardi, great teachers, mentors, and coaches throughout history. Joined now by Adam Carolla. Don't do your best, do my best. Time to be motivated, inspired, and get wise. It's time to take a knee. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. No choice but to get on mandate. Get it on and welcome to Take a Knee, our inspirational, motivational podcast. We have a real-life rocket scientist and self-help author. Olympia LaPointe is our guest. Good to meet you, Olympia. It's wonderful to be on your show. Well, you have a very interesting story. I know some of it. So, uh, And I should uh, plug the book, Answers Unleashed 2, The Science of Attracting What You Want. It'll be available February 26 on Amazon and all the major bookstores as well. Um, geez, where do we start? Well, let's start with your, your unlikely story. What would you like to know? <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> well, where do you where do you grow up? Oh my! I grew up in uh, close to South Central Los Angeles in uh, the 1980s. If you are familiar with it, it is uh, the same place where Tupac uh, grew up. Uh, it is the same place as Nipsey Hussle. I grew up in the area that was very hard, and I had to find a way to reprogram my brain so I could overcome the challenges that I faced. And I love helping people reprogram their brain on my website, AnswersUnleashed.com, and through my books, Answers Unleashed, because uh, there's a process to the way in which you reprogram your thinking. And when you can like master that process, you actually can succeed in life. And so I'm really excited to share that with you. Uh, but my life was like really, really hard. <laughs> well, really hard. I guess the first thing you have to do in order to sort of reprogram yourself, because I, I had to do a fair bit of reprogramming myself and my life, which is you first have to kind of realize this isn't what you want and maybe not what you're destined for, even if it even if you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know what? I want to say something, Adam. I have been your fan for such a long time. I remember when you were on Love Lines uh, years and years ago, and it was that with Dr. Drew. And uh, I was in the middle of South Central Los Angeles trying to get my education as a teen uh, facing all this and trying to get to school just to get there to learn. And I remember listening to your show and at nighttime. And I remember you used to say, sometimes your best role model is the people that you don't want to be like. Well, yeah. and I remember that. Well, and, and I remember keeping that in the back of my head. And I'm like, what do I want that I'm not seeing now? Uh, I saw gang violence. I saw poverty. I saw, uh, I saw uh, my next door neighbor's throat slash. And that's what I write about in the book. When you grow up with such a difficult way of envisioning the world, it becomes tough for you to see the world in anything else other than chaos, unless you look at the exact opposite of what you're seeing and shoot for that. And you have to actually envision that. In, in, in my book, I talk about there's three parts of our thinking and our decision making. It is the future envisioning part. It is the past where you have to overcome the fears that you've experienced. And it is the moment in time, which is the present, that you have the opportunity to make a decision. And that decision allows you to move forward to your next step. And often when we're in those tough situations, we have to look at exactly what we want and think about how is this decision that I'm going to make right here, right now, going to change so I can move towards what I see for myself what versus what I don't want. Yeah, I probably have gotten more out of seeing negative imagery or behavior or just people acting in a way that I thought wouldn't behoove me, what doesn't behoove them. I, I got a ton out of that. You know, it's so funny because when we talk about visualization and positive visualization and positivity and role models. 
we always think about, you know, find Tom Brady and look up to Tom Brady or find Harriet Tubman and look up to Harriet Tubman. But in a way, those are very distant goals. You know, sometimes the people are dead. Other times they are, you know, a coast away from us and our life resembles theirs. Not at all. But you can look over to your neighbor's house and see them getting into a fist fight with their wife and, uh, you know, their kids smoking cigarettes out on the porch while the parents are having a fist fight in the kitchen. And you can say, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't that. want that. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, in in my TED talk, uh, uh, Reprogram Your Brain to Overcome Fear, I talk about uh, I was in a fifth grade classroom and uh, I got into an argument with this boy that was right uh, sitting directly next to me. And we got into a fight over off of a verbal argument, I should say off of a piece of paper. And it was uh, it was interesting because he was a 10 year old boy that was already recruited into gangs. And I was also a 10 year old girl that was studying in the classroom. And we got into an argument and he stood up and he had this ring on his finger that he filed down uh, like a knife. And so when we got into argument, he hit, he hit my eye. I almost lost my eye. I lost my vision for a while. And I was rushed to the hospital. I had to have five layers of stitches. And my mother wanted the boy expelled. She said, this, this isn't going to happen to my daughter. I'm going to make sure that she's going to be safe. Uh, the school didn't expel the boy. So my mother put me into another school. But in the process of that turmoil was the best thing that ever happened for me. I got a chance to see a different life. When my mother actually put me into a school that was two hours away from my hometown, I was able to see a different world. I was able to see what it was like when people actually prioritize studying. I was able to see what it was like when people actually have enough food that they can bring their lunch to actually the school so they can eat it. I was like, I grew up in poverty, didn't have any money. And when I realized that the main difference between the people who succeed in life versus the people who don't succeed in life is their thinking. If someone is able to change the way in which they are thinking and they are able to make decisions per where they want to go versus where they don't want to go, that's when someone has the, the aha moment where they're able to change your life situation. And in every single moment in time, someone has to see exactly what they want. I saw all these kids, they had all this uh, this, this really great uh, opportunities in front of them. And I said to myself, I may not be from Beverly Hills like some of these other students are. I may not have uh, a father in the house. And I may be uh, living in poverty off of $5 that had to keep all of us four of us uh, alive for a week. But no matter what I was going through, I was going to make something out of my life. And in my book, I talk about, we have to make six key decisions, six key decisions to change our life into the direction that we want. And if we understand early on that we have these six decisions that we can make, then we are empowered to actually start moving forward. So that next door neighbor that we see that's in a fight with his girlfriend or whatever it else that you're talking about, we can see that's what I don't want. That's not what I want. What I want is the, the opportunity to make choices in these six different areas of my life. And in my book, I talk about the six different areas. The first one, the faith. Are you here and are you alive? And what is your purpose? Are you alive for a reason? Once someone actually decides that, yes, I'm placed on this planet for a reason. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm going to find it out. That decision in itself transforms your life. And that's actually the first decision. Um, where did you go to school? When oh, you transferred? I grew, yeah, I actually, I, I was fortunate. My mother placed me into John Burroughs Junior High School. Uh, it was like this gifted academy. And it was, I was like struggling. I actually failed algebra and like, <laughs> I laugh now. And I launched 28 rockets to space, which is amazing. But I actually failed algebra, failed geometry, failed calculus and failed chemistry on my way to getting there. And uh, I graduated, I had to take the classes over and I graduated from John Burroughs Junior High. And then I went to Alexander Hamilton Music Academy. 
And uh, it was great. Uh, Jim Burke, uh, pr- the major producer, Jim Burke, he mm-hmm. was our uh, principal at the time. And I was in the Performing Arts Academy. And I actually trained to be a pre- professional performer. I trained to sing, act, dance. Uh, and I was in musical theater and I learned to play the piano. And that was the most excellent opportunity that I had to uh, hone in on my creative side. And then there was a teacher there, Mr. Provencio. I wonder where he is, but Mr. Provencio, years ago, uh, he volunteered his time to actually help the students understand their mathematics during the winter break. And I remember uh, borrowing a dollar thirty-five each day so I could get to the campus in the winter break I would be on the bus for two hours each way just so I could sit with him for one hour and that moment changed my life. He showed me calculus. Now I had been making a D in calculus. I didn't understand how it was working. I didn't understand the symbols or the terminology, but he sat down with me. And it was through that moment in time that I realized the only person that was stopping me was myself and it was because of fear. If I could learn how to reprogram the way in which I was thinking, so I wasn't going to be scared of something that I didn't know how to do, but rather become excited that I had a chance to actually learn it. That's when I changed the whole course of my life. I, I, this is when I talk about the second decision. It's you have to choose your identity. Who will you be? Will you be a person that's always going to be scared and like afraid to move forward? Or will you make a decision where you you see, I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to try it. I'm going to, if I still fail, I'm going to fail. But I owe it to myself to be the person which I see myself becoming, which is that person who is able to succeed no matter what. And uh, I'm very fortunate because I took the AP test and I, I still failed it. I mean, that was the craziest thing. I was tutored by him a long time and I still failed it. But I had now this courage inside of me where I'm like, well, if I could still learn and, and still eventually pick this up, I can actually do this. And I graduated uh, from Alexander Hamilton High School. Uh, it was a music academy. And then I went to California State University, Northridge, where I majored in mathematics and actually graduated top of the class, one out of top five out of 6,500 graduating class in mathematics. And it was because I simply just kept going and didn't stop. The uh, I think Burroughs is in Burbank, California. Is that correct? Uh, or Glendale? Uh, that's the high school. John Burroughs is actually, uh, now it is... It, it was always located off of McCadden, off of Wilshire Boulevard oh, in LA. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that, yeah. That Miracle was like 30, mile. Was like 30, 30 years ago. Wow! I must be dating myself. <laughs> well, you know, when you have these, I, I, I don't think what pe- people don't understand a few things. Um, <clears throat> I always kind of talk about, because I, I know the poor person mentality because I grew up in that world as well. Your first mistake you make is you just sort of think everything is for somebody else. You know, I would see, I would watch TV, I'd watch The Love Boat, I'd see the guys getting onto the ship and the guys wearing a blazer or sport coat. And I would think, who has a sport coat, you know? Or I'd see them with matching luggage getting onto the ship. And I'd go, who has matching luggage, you know? And they'd be going on a cruise and I'd go like, who goes on a cruise? Or, you know, it was always who, who, who. And the biggest, the most insidious thing between, I always think between the haves and the have nots is not so much the money. It's, it's not so much a monetary thing. It's an emotional thing. You just sit there and go, who does this? Who saves for college? Who has credit cards? Who has life insurance? Who has auto insurance? Who has health insurance? Who goes on vacations? Who hugs their kids? You know, oh, this sort of crazy, that's not us world. That, that's for somebody else. And you'd, you'd see it in all the commercials and you just thought, I'd watch the Brady Bunch and I'd go, who has these family meetings where the mom and the dad sit down with the kids and they eat, eat dinner at the same time or they say grace. And 
it, the, the big disconnect wasn't they have money and we don't. It's they participate in life and we don't. And that's for other people. That's not for us. And once you decide it's not for you, uh, well, then it's not going to be you. You bring up a really, really good point. Uh, I think that is true for a lot of people. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're black, it doesn't matter if you're Asian. If you're growing up with no money, you have a different look on life. And, and that's one of the decisions that I, I write about in my book. You have to decide that whatever resources that you have, you're gonna use them to your best ability to actually create the life that you want. Now, I, I was like you, I, I didn't know that there, I didn't even know half the things in which people do. Like I didn't know that people save. I didn't know that people actually put money into life insurance policies and then borrow against them for like things in the future. That's something in which I would see on TV, but it wasn't something that was real life to me. And it was, it's, it's funny. We have to make an effort to actually see how other people live. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't matter if you're rich to see what it is to, for how it is that a person that has no money, how they live, or it doesn't matter if you're poor, you have to see how someone else lives. And in, in doing that, you actually start seeing that you have the ability to change your situation, no matter what type of situation that you're in. And this brings up uh, my third decision that I bring up in the book is your intent. You have to actually have an intent, meaning when you're in a situation, are you going to think that the situation is going to break you or are you going to change it? That's a big, that, that, that answer to that question alone is going to define how someone treats their life. Meaning the people that understand that no matter where they go, no matter where they stand, no matter where they choose to be, whether they be in a corporate room or cleaning toilets, it is because it is their decision to change whatever environment that they're in. And when you make that decision, you then own your life where you're not just looking at somebody taking luggage. You're actually choosing what you want to bring and decide that you want to have luggage. That is the process. When yeah. someone is able to think what is my intent in this situation? Like when I went to, uh, when I started as a rocket scientist, uh, it was really tough. It was in 1998. And I remember uh, helping, I remember being in the mission control room and helping support mission control. I was one of uh, the 20 people that was helping uh, create new engine rockets. And I was a, a part of the um, space shuttle program and as well as the the advanced programs that we now actually are seeing in the sky that we can actually talk about now that they've actually been developed. Uh, I was one of the people, but I was like the only woman out of 200 people. It's since changed, but that was like in 1998. If you can remember <laughs> Catherine Johnson's experience when she was uh, in the movie Hidden Figures, that mm -hmm. was like my life, but it was back in 1998. And I remember being in that situation. I had to think to myself, am I going to succumb to the pressure in which I'm experiencing from some people who didn't want to see me there? Or was I going to get the help from people who would fight for me so I could be there? That was a big difference. How am I going to change the situation which I am in so I can contribute to the, my environment to actually make a difference. And I'm really happy because we were able to foresee the future and prevent major explosions on the space shuttle. And we save lives because of the value that I brought to the table that could contribute to the teams that allowed us to actually create engines that would save people's lives. So it was that decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to be in this environment and think that I don't have what it takes? Or am I going to bring what I have and show my value and change the environment that I'm in? When you are able and when anyone is able to take that mind frame and actually decide I'm going to change my environment, that opens doors in itself, that decision alone. I think what a lot of people do, and I was probably guilty of it in that sort of 
downtrodden, poor mentality is you you're in your situation and then you see people driving a fancy car, living in a big house or living a sort of a life on, you know, going on cruises on the love boat. And you think to yourself, I want to be there. Like I'm, I want that car. So the mistake is you think, I wish I had a Lamborghini, but you sort of forego the part where you go, how do you get into that position? What is this journey? You know, everyone gets in this thing where they just hop right to the end. Like, I want that mansion. I want that lifestyle. I want that car. I want those vacations. Right. But now let's deconstruct that. You can't just leapfrog right to the Lamborghini. I used alliteration there, by the way. You (laughs) must... Or fast forward to the Ferrari. You got to figure out, well, what is in between where you are in that $250,000 car? And then you can begin to embark on the journey. If you just keep thinking about landing in the car and buying lottery tickets, that's basically what the lottery's for. But also, if you just landed in that car, you'd have no skills to maintain it. You'd have no ability to take care of it properly and that entire world. That'd be like if somebody just handed you a giant successful business, you'd run it into the ground in six months because you have not built up that skill set. So start embarking on the journey that gets you to the Lamborghini. Don't just think about landing in the Lamborghini. Ooh, can I just say amen? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may. I or maybe you did. It is like... It is like wisdom that you're speaking. And and, and I want to just really break it down in a tangible way uh, from my own experience and, and give this example. Uh, this brings me to the next decision is, will you decide to learn? Will you decide to learn? And not only that, will you decide to learn what is the truth versus something that's not reality? That is the key question. Now, If you were to get this Lamborghini, let's use that example. If you were to get this Lamborghini, Lamborghinis are not automatic cars. (laughs) Lamborghinis, most Lamborghinis have some sort of of, uh, gear drive, a manual. If the the real Lamborghinis, you have to know that manual transmission if you really want to use it. If you don't know how to drive a manual transmission, you're going to strip every single gear on that fancy car and it's going to be worth nothing. The key thing is that whatever we do, we have to build up to get there. Like if you want to drive this Lamborghini, you maybe start learning how to drive just a regular stick shift and the Honda Accord first to make sure you don't strip the gears, things like that. How do you maintain a basic car? And, and I remember seeing all these, uh, uh, executive owners. And and I remember being a a scientist at the time, and I remember thinking to myself, I wonder what it's like to own a business after being a scientist. I would see all these men, these men, they would own these corporations and they'd own these consulting firms after they retired from rocket science. And they said, okay, I'm going to own these firms and I'm going to hire people and I'm going to have these consultants and we're going to go all to these aerospace companies and give this information. And I remember looking at them thinking to myself, how do I do that? How, how do I own my own company after I choose to leave uh, rocket science and actually create something for myself? What do I do? And it's a process. I had to learn how, oh, the difference in the types of companies. There's, C co- uh, there's uh, corporations, there's S corporations, there's sole proprietorships. They have different tax structures. And when I first started my corporation in, uh, whoa, wow, it was like 2008. Wow. When I think about it, when I first started this, I I didn't know anything. I didn't know about trademarks. I didn't know about how to put up a proper website. I didn't know how to create contracts and all these things I had to learn. I did. I I didn't go to business school. I wasn't a person that uh, learned uh, how to to uh, invest in, in a, a gain a return on investment. I had to think about this and, and learn from people 
who were in that role. And I remember when I made the decision to leave rocket science, it was actually for the wrong decision. I made a decision to leave rocket science because I was given a better offer at a banking institution where I was making three times more money. And I've learned this, never do something for money, do something because you love doing it. And, and for me, I left for the wrong reason. I went for the money because someone wanted to uh, capitalize on the skills in which I could bring so there wasn't going to be a money shortage across the United States. And I, I solved the problem, but in that role, I realized I'm not passionate about banking. I'm passionate about science. I'm passionate about helping someone understand how to think critically and actually solve problems. And that's the way that mathematics and science allows someone to actually find solutions. And so I made the decision to leave uh, the corporate, uh, I decided to leave that uh, corporate banking job and go into my own business. And it was tough. I remember, uh, I remember I was living off of $1,200 a month for like the first year. I went through all my savings. And after I went through all my savings, I was living off of $1,200 a month. I was teaching part-time as a math professor and I wasn't making any money. And I thought to myself, I've got to change this situation. I've got to create something for myself, but I didn't even know how to do it. And Anytime that we are in a tough situation, there's always a skill that we can bring to the table that we can get money for. Uh, and, and we contribute this professionally. And I'm a strong believer in setting up businesses in the sense of you can create something, uh, a product, a service, a, a, a way for you to provide your gift to the world so you actually gain monetary funds for doing what it is that you love doing. And, and for me, I love teaching. I loved showing mathematics. I love showing science. And so I decided I was going to write a book. And I didn't know anything how to write a book. <laughs> and so that brought me to my first book, Mathophobia. Uh, in that book, I help people overcome their fear of math so they can actually find solutions to things. And in that process, I learned how to do business. Uh, there's, a, there's a business to book publishing. Uh, there's a strong business to book publishing. There's people across the world that need help. They need help in making sure they learn. There's textbooks all out there. What is it that you're going to do to make your product different? How are you going to create the right contracts to make sure that your book gets sold? Uh, what is it that you're going to do? In, in each one of these time frames, you and I and all of us have to find out what it takes to get something done. So in that process of finding out what it takes, that learning of you're not going to know how to do it when you first do it, but you're actually going to decide to do it. And each day you're going to decide, I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to learn how to put together a contract. I'm going to learn how to keep my money. I'm going to learn how to get the right insurances for the products in which I'm uh, distributing. And in the process of learning that, that is the confidence you have that allows you to know that you're going to have solutions in every area of your life. Well, let's talk about fear because uh, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big subject for me. Um, I know people that are fear-based. I think I I come from a family that's very fear-based, and I, I saw how obstructive it was to their happiness, but to their productivity, to their success. Um, I've not, uh, I'm not fear-based. I've, I've made an, at least an attempt not to be fear-based. And some of it is once you're not fear-based, you just announce to people you're not fear-based and then you sort of act as if, and even if something does make you nervous, is you just proceed because you say, I'm not that person. I'm not, I'm not fear-based, but many people are fear-based and it seems to be a little bit of an epidemic lately and that everyone is scared of this. And the COVID thing has probably kicked everyone oh. into high gear with this. And they're, <clears throat> it's the death of math. They're, they're not doing the math on whether they're vulnerable or not, whether this is going to affect them or not, whether their chances of, you know, eating, dining outdoors and all, you know, I could go on and on, but there is a death of math and in, 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 in which case people aren't factoring in, you know, probabilities and, and real danger. 
<clears throat> and then everyone has become so sort of fear-based and it, almost in a sort of animalistic way, like, you know, like the way your dog would be scared of a lawnmower that the neighbor was pushing up and back. But, the, but you know that lawnmower poses no danger to you or your dog, but your dog doesn't understand it. Your dog just hears a lot of noise and sees this contraption and is wanting to walk to the other side of the street. And I, I feel like a lot of human beings are falling into that trap as well. Again, first, death of math. Um, second, a kind of a narcissism where you've decided that if it's scary to you, well, then it is thus scary. And this is something we've been pitching, you know, like you can't deny the person their feelings, you know, and you go, well, they shouldn't, their feelings are incorrect. They shouldn't have felt threatened when the person put their hand on their shoulder or whatever it is. Well, I felt like I was being attacked. Well, you're wrong. So get over it and move forward. But we're not saying that to anybody. It's if you felt threatened, then you were threatened. And now we're going to reverse engineer the situation to make it as if you were threatened. And now you're just walking through life, feeling threatened, feeling vulnerable, feeling insecure. I don't know why you would want to do that to a kid, especially. I spend a bunch of, bunch of time <laughs> sort of telling my kids, get over it. You're fine. Walk it off. No, you don't have to. You know, you guys ordered Grubhub and we don't have to dip the bag in rubbing alcohol in order to bring it into the house. <laughs> but I feel well, like it's an uphill battle. Yeah. I feel like society, I'm doing battle against society with this. Do you know what? You are you are not alone. And, and the entire world is going through fear. And I would say the entire United States is like in this survival mode. There is such fear going on. And I write about that in my second uh, chapter of my book, Answers Unleashed, too. It is when we experience fear, there's such things that comes up called an inner child. And psychologists talk about this all the time. It is when we revert our thinking to the innermost challenges in which we've experienced in the past, and we don't think rationally, meaning the reptilian part of the brain takes over and our frontal brain lobes that are responsible for creative problem solving and actually calculating things through and actually seeing the future and actually making plans for it, that completely goes kaput. It just completely stops working when we experience fear. And I talk about there's six different times in our life where we experience fear. Uh, and these times actually warp our thinking. It happens in our faith. It happens in our identity. It happens in our intent. It happens in our how we use our resources. It happens how we learn. And it also happens how we love ourselves. And when we experience fear, we start thinking like a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, if, if you're uh, scared of spiders and you see, uh, let's say that you were six years old when a spider jumped on you and you had to kill it or it bit you or something like that when you're six years old, if you see a spider when you're like a, a, a 45 year old man, you're gonna be like, that, that fear is gonna come up again unless you learn how to address it and treat it. Realize you're bigger than a spider and you can actually stomp on it. But if someone doesn't figure that out and actually live through a circumstance where they actually change the scenario, they're gonna still keep thinking that there's still that eight year old kid that can't do something about it. So in the moment of fear that we're experiencing, we're seeing a breakdown of society. We're seeing two different worlds. We're seeing a group of people who are actually solving problems and creating inventions and actually moving forward with the chaos that we are experiencing. And that's what I talk about in my second book. When we experience chaos, we actually can reprogram our thinking to actually use chaos to, to allow us to create inventions. Or we... We, when people are in that scary situation in the United States, they revert to thinking like a kid. And what do kids do? They are scared to tackle the situation. They think that their way is the only way to do things. They may not uh, be aware that there is a new approach that can be taken because it's that fear state that people are in that keeps them from seeing things rationally. And the, the solution that I bring to the table is it's okay to feel that way, but recognize you have to get out of it. 
that it's okay to actually feel scared. Like uh, when the pandemic happened, I had just come from my surgery. I had uh, in 2019, I had to take out a dangerous tumor and it was like for, I'm, it was like the scariest thing, but I am healthy and well, but I was still recovering from my surgery. Then my mother went through a surgery and then she came home. And the day she came home, I brought her over into my uh, home here so I could take care of her. The day she came home from the surgery, the pandemic hit. And I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do? I mean, I've got to get food for to take care of my mom. You know, I've got to get water. She just came from a, a kidney surgery and, and toilet tissue. <laughs> it was like all these things. And so I went to this store and I, and I talk about this in the book. And I, I'm sure a lot of people also went through this. They go to the grocery store and it feels like Armageddon. There's nothing on the shelves, no water, no toilet tissue, uh, it, no food. And that moment in time for me brought back uh, that, that time when I was feeling like a kid in complete poverty, not being able to buy food in the store because I didn't have money. And, and that moment in time going into the store during the pandemic, the 2020 pandemic, triggered me into thinking I was still a kid that couldn't get the things that I needed to survive. And I remember walking out into the parking lot after, after all that chaos inside the, the store, the grocery store I went to, and I had to catch my breath. And I was thinking to myself, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And I remember looking at myself thinking, I'm not thinking like an adult. I'm not thinking like Olympia. I'm thinking like a child because of the fear. And all of us, every single one of us go through that fear state. But the question is, what are we going to do to get out of it? We each have this, uh, I call it the future self, this ability to actually see what's going to happen in the future and then make decisions based on that. And so I had to get out of that moment in time of thinking that I was a child not being able to do something and think rationally. I said, Olympia, this is not going to be like this forever. You're experiencing a pandemic, and this pandemic is eventually going to, to resolve itself. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be in a couple of months, but you can get through this. This is something in which you can do. What is your next step? And I think, okay, my next step is put the stuff in my trunk, you know, put the groceries in my trunk, get home, clean off the groceries. And that's what we were all doing at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was that moment in time when we, every single one of us, doesn't it doesn't matter how old you are, you will experience fear. That is a natural part of life because that shows that you're still alive. But the question is, in that moment, what are you going to do to reground yourself back in the reality that you have? Because in that moment, when you recognize that you have a de decision and a choice, that turns on your frontal brain lobes so your reptilian brain isn't firing and you're able to start seeing things clearly and start learning what it is that you need to do to move forward. When we make a decision that we're going to learn, like, for example, if the entire United States makes a decision, we're going to learn about this virus. We're going to understand how it is, how the mutations actually transfer to people. We're going to learn the warning signs. We're going to put public or service announcements to make sure that everyone understands the ramifications about going to certain rooms and about the different type of mask and what different cleaning supplies work on um, breaking down the fat molecule that's around the virus. If people were to actually decide that they were going to learn about it instead of being fearful of it, then we wouldn't see some of the things in which we're experiencing right now, which is pe some people just going out, wear not wearing any masks, not being concerned about other people who are there around. And we would see a lot of the fear-based mental mentality shift. Now, there's always going to be some people out there that just don't even care about anything. And that's just how society is. We're always going to experience some people that will not care about other people. And that's just a fact. But you got to figure out where are you in this situation? Am I a person that's going to care about my life and other people's lives? If so, what am I going to do to learn so I can move forward and get over this fear? I think what a lot of people don't understand is the media gets paid with fear. They, fear pays. And I'm not even saying that they are lying, but let's face it that's sort of how their bread is buttered, you know? So they say airplane travel, is it safe? 
you know, news at 11, you know, they, they plant that stuff. They don't, there is no news, which is everything's hunky dory. Go about your business. You know, it's killer bees are coming in from Texas. They're heading to California. You know, it's a lot of, they're fear based. They're fear. That's why all those, you know, podcasts about abductions and, you know, the nine year old (laughs) was walking to school and if it could happen here, it could happen anywhere. She was abducted. And, you know, it's all we're so fear based and we're fear based in, in a way. As I think about it, you know, I think I think everyone understands the general construct of um, sexuality and sexiness and a physicality. And so you get the beautiful woman and she's, you know, up on the billboard and she's advertising furniture, you know, but she's beautiful. So we're attracted to that or the good looking guy who's doing the commercial for the cigarettes or the beer, whatever it is. Like we like we're, we we have a sexuality. We, we're attracted to the opposite sex or sometimes to your own sex. But there's a an aesthetic that's attractive, and that's why, you know, hair and beauty and makeup and all this stuff is a multi-cajillion-dollar-year industry. But we're just as attracted to fear because if you think about it, is is much – there may be more fear-based advertising than there is sexually-based advertising. There may be more commercials saying, you know, Lysol kills 99.9% of germs, you know, and then they show the countertop and the housewife and they show all the germs on the countertop and all the commercials for, you know, insurance and life. I mean, think about how many insurance come, you know, so they got us with the fear. They they know we're fear based and they, they fear based. And they, yeah. they and they spoon feed it to us and we're eager recipients of their heaping helping of fear that they constantly serve us. They serve it up every night, every day. Turn on any news outlet, you know, whatever. Fear. So we're experiencing a lot of fear. And and actually I have a I I've observed something. Uh there's a different generation happening. Uh I'm a of a a little bit of an older generation than the millennials. I'm kind of like on a border line. I'm, uh, I'm, why am I supposed to say I'm, I'm proud to be a 44 year old woman and I'm thankful I look younger, but I'm 44. So I'm a little bit older than the millennials, but then I'm not like uh, the, I'm not in my fifties or sixties with the, the uh, other generation. And so I noticed there's a, a, a disconnect. Uh, I noticed that a lot of marketing and advertisements on TV deals with fear based. And you're right. They deal with uh, what type of problem are you having and how can our product solve it? And and, and I noticed that the millennials and the people who are younger, they're looking at how their life can be easier. It's mm-hmm. not like the, what the problem is. It's more like, how can my life be easier so I don't have to do the work? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a fear of work. <laughs> my nephews <laughs> have that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of people that have that type of thinking. Yeah. And so uh, I noticed that a lot of younger people may not tune into TV as much, but they tune in online and they tune into YouTube and they tend on to tune into Instagram and they tend on to social media. But here's the catch. A lot of things on the YouTube and and Instagram, it's not vetted in the same way that a news channel on a TV program would be. Like um, I appear on CBS News uh, regularly as an expert to talk about SpaceX launches. And so knowing that, I I have to make sure every single information that I present is accurate, it's on time, it it is vetted. And, and I'm very thankful and honored to provide that to the producers over at uh, the different TV shows that I am on as a science expert. But I noticed that uh, the younger generation may be looking at uh, Instagram, uh, social media, uh, YouTube, where some of the information is not vetted. And they fall trapped to these conspiracy theory type of videos thinking it's true simply because they've never been exposed to anything other than that. They've never learned about it. And so the fear aspect is coming into people's lives by them watching videos that are not vetted, watching videos that may not be real. And because of that, they are increasing their fear about what could happen because they don't know the actual reality. And so when we can actually decide to place an emphasis 
in society on like, okay, you're watching something. Is it real? I remember having my eight-year-old niece contact me up and she said, my mom watched this video on YouTube that's scary and I don't think it's real. And it was something like really crazy. It was like one of these, like, what would happen if you land on Mars or something like that? It was like reenactment. And she was like scared. And it was all, no one's, no one, no human has ever landed on Mars. So obviously this video was fake. So I had to tell my eight-year-old niece, do you know what? Not everything you see on TV is real. <laughs> Not everything you see on, on the internet is real. There's such things as fiction. There's some things as just production. And so you have to actually learn what is real in school and actually decide and discern based on what you are seeing. A lot of people can tell you anything, but the question is, is it accurate? For example, you could be a business owner. Are you gonna take advice from somebody that has never been in your shoes? Or are you gonna take advice from somebody who actually has made millions of dollars? That's a big difference. So it actually brings me to the next uh, decision that people make, and this is why I write about it in my book. It's like, you have to know how to use your resources. You have to know how to use your resources so you actually move forward. Now, a lot of the millennials and the people who are younger do not have the resources of the older generation. And, and unfortunately, that, that in itself is troubling to a lot of younger people. They don't have the 401k. They don't have their savings. They've gone through not only a uh, 2008 uh, financial crash, they've gone through the 2020 pandemic. And so when we experience a fear, it can come into the form of, I don't have enough. I don't have what it takes. I don't have what I need to move forward. And that is a feeling of shame that comes up in people in addition to the fear. And I just want to tell people out there, if you're, in the, if, if you're listening to this and if you're an audience member right now, I want you to specifically know that that's not your future. <laughs> that's not your future. Your future is of abundance and your future is of success and it's only if you decide for that. Any moment in time, we can change our situation. We can change the direction of our lives. And if you think that your life has to go in one direction and that you won't have enough, that's what you choose. If you choose to decide that you're gonna use what you got, you're gonna use your talents, you're gonna use your money that you have, the little bit that you have, you're gonna invest it. If you decide that you're going to use the real information in which you see, you're gonna go far. But it is that decision to do that. And, and there's somebody out there, there's an audience person that's out there. I don't know who you are, but there's an audience person out there. You think that living in poverty is the only way in which you're going to see your future. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Well, that you can get an education and move forward. But it depends on you recognizing that you have what it takes inside of you to do it. Well, the Ooh. good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> amen. The, uh, see, by nature, as soon as you get into the fear uh, posture, you've given up control because fear is what happens to you. You know, so when you are running from a grizzly bear, you're scared and you're not in any position to do anything but get away, you know, save yourself. And so if you go through life with a kind of one foot in the fear bucket the whole time, you're completely giving, you're, you're giving up, your ability to make change and to take control of your life. Fear means I have no control. Fear is you're in the back of an airplane and the airplane is going down. There, you're not the pilot and there's nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. So if you want to live in that fear zone, that means you'll have, you'll never be in the pilot seat. I, I will guarantee you that the pilots who have more information than you do in the back of the plane are much less fearful when that plane is heading down than the person in the back of the plane because <laughs> they're along for the ride. So you, the fear puts you in this along for the ride. And yeah. now you're kind of subject to the whims of society or, or whatever way the wind is blowing. So, 
try to get out of that fear posture. Try to get out of that position. Put yourself into a proactive, into the pilot seat versus the passenger seat, and at least have control over your life. So I, I don't know any fearful person that's successful. I'll, I'll put it to you that way. It's it's impossible to be successful when you're fear based because you've you've given up control of your of your own life. Well, I, I'm going to break it down to us in a way that's really uh, in a way in which you will always remember. And if you're listening, I, I want you always to remember this. Whenever you hear a voice and you're really scared of something that tell and then whatever that voice to hear in your ear and it says you're not going to be good enough or you're not going to do things well i want you to recognize that's not your voice in it in and i'm going to say that again that is not your voice your voice your true authentic voice is a voice that encourages you your true authentic voice is a voice that says i'm scared but i'm going to learn your true authentic voice is a voice that says, I don't know how to do this. And I, I am, I am completely don't know what to do, but I'm going to find someone to help me. That's your voice. I've noticed out of, I've helped thousands of people and I'm very thankful. I've helped thousands of people uh, in math tutoring programs when I was an undergraduate at California state university, Northridge. And I felt helped thousands of students, uh, teaching as a part-time math professor for the years before uh, writing my books. And I've helped a lot of people and I've all, I've noticed this. There's certain, there's certain, it's like the same voice that comes up in people's ear. And it's like, it doesn't even matter where they're from. They could be from uh, China. They can be from India. They can be from the United States. It's the same voice just spoken in different words. It is. It, and they always say the same things. You're not good enough. You're not going to, you're going to fail at this. You're going to, to um, lose all your money. You, you shouldn't speak up. It is the same words. It, 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 it's the same words. And I guarantee you, you've heard one of those words before. I've heard them myself. Uh, my students have heard them. Uh, my mom's heard them. And it is actually not your voice. It's actually voice of fear. And I'm a strong believer that we have a natural uh, base sphere that is inside of us that helps us transform that energy into success. And then there's the fear outside of us that makes us think that it's our voice. And it's and I'm really 100% sure that it's the same fear voice. And, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It's the same words repeated over and over again. So whenever you are experiencing that voice, I want you to just take a note of the voice. If it makes you feel agitated, like for example, if you hear something that says, if you put all your money here, you're gonna lose it all. You're gonna lose it all. And it, it makes you feel agitated and it makes you want really, really agitated. Just listen to that voice, but see if it sounds truthful. You'll know. Every single person has this gut instinct in them. I call it their own intuition that guides them to know what's true and what's not. Everyone's different, but everyone has that ability inside them to be able to feel what's right. If you hear something and you don't feel it's right, listen to that. Listen to your gut. Know it. If you hear something that, let's say, um, is fearful, like, oh, I don't know how to do this, but if you have like that feeling inside of you where you feel like you want to actually do it and it, it's, it, it feels exciting, even though it's scary. Like for example, um, I, I did, uh, when I first put together my platform on AnswersUnleashed.com, I didn't know how to do it. And I remember uh, uh, someone asked me to start uh, my uh, radio show that I was doing uh, for a while while the campus was open. And I didn't know how to do it. And I was like scared. I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I don't know. I've never know. I don't know anything about hosting a radio show. <laughs> I had no clue about that. But it was, even though I didn't know how to do it, it was that feeling inside of me where it felt like um, I was going to explore. I was going to be free. Anytime you have a decision in front of you where you feel that you're going to be free in making that decision, that is 
the, the voice you listen to, where you will be free. And anytime you hear a voice where you feel it's like, it, 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 it just, a voice where it just makes your gut turn. And if you just feel really bad about it, that's a sign, don't go that direction. Go the direction in which when you make that decision, you will feel free to be able to continue on the path in which you want for yourself. Well, very wise words to go out on. The book, Answers Unleashed 2, The Science of Attracting What You Want. It's available February 26 on Amazon, all major bookstores as well. The website, AnswersUnleashed.com. You can shoot uh, Olympia a Twitter or tweet at Olympia LaPointe, and it's spelled just uh, how it is, how it sounds. Um, Olympia, I feel like we should do a part two because uh, oh we didn't God. even scratch just, the surface. surface here. Oh, my God, yes. You know, I love your show. I've been loving your show for decades now, everywhere that you've been going. And I, I love this. I would love to do a part two because there's so many people out there that need to know the truth and need to know how to overcome their fear. And I'm just honored, honored to share uh, what I know with your audience. And so thank you. Well, thanks, Olympia. And thanks for being so positive and energetic. And uh, I hope it's contagious. Uh, <laughs> once again, Answers Unleashed 2. It's coming out uh, February 26. And until next time, it's Adam Carolla for Olympia LaPointe saying mahalo. Congratulations, you're now a better person. And by the way, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for you. Download more wisdom and inspiration next week on Take a Knee. This is Corolla Digital.